Um, it's, it's a great priv privilege to be here for the second time, although <clears throat> I have to say um, I, I question Boson's timing. Um, the, for last year, I was forced to follow um, Mrs. Um, Ezequiteli, um, and this year I've been forced to follow another dynamic Nigerian woman, um, <clears throat> um, Mrs. Awasika. So um, I'm, I've drawn the short straw on both occasions, and um, um, if I come again, Boson, we'll need to sort this out. Uh, I'm feeling very inadequate now as, as a result. So firstly, I wanted to thank um, everybody at Co-Creation Hub for, <clears throat> for the second year putting on such a fantastic event. Um, we at Amidia Network, as you heard from Boson, have been uh, delighted and proud to be sponsors of Co-Creation Hub since its inception um, six years ago. And one of the reasons we support it is because it's, it's a, it is the, the focus for social innovation um, here in Nigeria. And you heard from Boson earlier on about some of the um, initiatives and organizations and companies that have been incubated here. Um, and we're really proud also now to be working with um, Co-Creation Hub on the next phase of their development. <coughs> Boson had, had explained earlier on about the, the Growth Capital Fund, which is going to be providing $5 million worth of investments into small and medium-sized businesses, technology initiatives, and things which will have real social impact. So we're absolutely delighted that we can continue with Co-Creation Hub to support these kind of endeavors. Because <coughs> as you heard from Mrs. Awasika, um, entrepreneurship, starting these kind of businesses is really what is making Nigeria great and what is really going to be about the future of Nigeria. So, so this is a great move forward. So thank you, Co-Creation Hub, for the work you're doing. I think, um, <coughs> okay, we've got um, some, some slides coming up. That's great. So the next session um, is going to be, um, you're going to get two Amidion Network uh, representatives for, for one session. Um, I'm going to frame this a little bit um, in terms of why we at Amidion Network exist the kind of things that we do and why we feel independent media and open communications is a real cat catalyst for social change. Um, my colleague Ori, um, who's based in Kenya and has spent a lot of time um, in Nigeria and in West Africa, is going to talk you through some of the findings from a study which we've commissioned with Reboot, um, which is a consultancy company, looking at some of the trends and the opportunities for independent media in Nigeria and Ghana specifically but also I think we'll have lessons um, in other parts of the, um, of, of the continent as well. So Ori's, Ori's going to take us through that report in more detail. So let me first of all just, say, for those of you who don't know, explain a little bit about Amidia Network. <coughs> we were set up um, as a philanthropic um, uh, investment firm, which is a kind of slightly odd term, um, but it allows us to invest in for-profit companies and also to give grants like a philanthropic foundation um, to organizations that have a social impact. Um, and Pierre and Pam Amidia, um, our founders, really believe in the potential of the individual, um, that people are inherently capable, but it's lack of opportunity that holds them back. So everything we do in Amidia Network across all of our initiatives is focused on helping people to realize that potential. Now, Ori and I both work for um, a part of that um, organization which focuses on governance and citizen engagement. And essentially here, we feel that individual opportunity um, is strengthened when you have capable and responsive governance. Um, and so what we, we're looking for here is we're trying to support organizations and initiatives that help to improve the relationship between government and its citizens and make government more responsive, make it more efficient, more effective, um, and more responsive to citizens' needs. So we, what we support, very briefly, four different blocks of activities. We're, we're very much technology driven. So we're looking at the opportunities presented by open data to inform people about public services, about the, um, the conduct and the efficiency of government. We're also looking at, as Boson mentioned earlier on, uh, one of the organizations we support is budget here in Nigeria. Um, and what we're looking at here is how do you inform people about the way in which government is spending money? How do you follow the money? How do you track the revenues and the expenses of government um, and to make sure that they're being spent where they ought to be, to be spent. We also support civic technology and what we mean by that is platforms that allow people to 
and you have uh, the, um, the, the way in which parliamentarians operate and the way in which government operates as well. And then finally, and we're going to be talking about this, of course, in much more detail, is the work we do in independent media. Just to give you a, su a sense of the kind of size and growth of our portfolio, um, so we've invested over the last 10 years about $177 million in governance alone, um, and about $26 million of that has been in independent media. So th and you'll see the, the green and the blue bars show that in the last couple of years we've really upped that activity and really upped our commitment to, to this work. So why independent media? Why is this an important part of governance? And I think, as Ori will describe through the Reboot study, technology has really changed the game in the last five years. Um, technology developments mean that everybody can be a reporter, everybody can be a witness. The whole concept of media is changing very rapidly um, through social media, through different platforms, and so on. We're, s we're seeing people's immediacy, the, the, the access to information that you couldn't have dreamed of 10 years ago is literally in our pockets and in our mobile phones. Um, we also believe that independent, impartial media are a critical means of holding government to account. If we want more effective government, we want more efficient government, we want more responsive government, independent media, if it works properly, can be a really effective means of holding leaders' feet to the fire and asking them awkward questions about what they should and shouldn't be doing. And Investigative journalism is something that we also support as well. And the Panama Papers, which made news around the world, is a great example of, of how that works. So as I showed you with the other the areas of our support on open data, on fiscal governance and civic tech, those are the kind of railway tracks, if you like, which enable accountability to, to, be, to better take hold. But independent media is, is the foghorn, it's the amplifier, um, which helps to produce this information in accessible forms and which allow people to, to access that on a, on a more regular basis. So here's some of the ex examples of, of um, organizations we've supported around the world. We support digital, um, for-profit media companies as well as supporting non-profit investigative journalism as well. And here's some of the um, uh, examples of organizations we've supported here in Africa. Um, Sahara Reporters, no doubt, you'll be familiar with. So I'm going to hand over to Ori now, um, but, um, and she's going to tell us a little bit more in detail about the, um, the report that Reboot have, have produced. But again, I'd just like to thank um, CC Hub for having us here um, and allow us to, to take part in this event um, over, over the day as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first time I'm doing a PowerPoint in like seven years or something, uh, the same, uh, you owe me. <laughs> and I'm really prefer just to, to talk. Um, and what an inspiring opening session. I, I remember the soon I've known, I think from Ushahidi days when you were trying to do the iHub, you were trying to do this. And I joined Google, and uh, 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 this story never gets old. Um, and I was told, well, you need to come to see what uh, is happening with CC Hub. They were just getting started. One floor, it was only this floor. And we got here with the driver, and I thought I was lost uh, when we stopped outside, <laughs> because Yaba was nothing. I mean, it's now 60 companies, but back then there was literally uh, CC Hub and Unilag as the outpost here. And, um, and I, I, I said, are you sure we're in the right place? This is a, you know, a tech hub. I was expecting uh, something different. And then we walked, the elevator wasn't working then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we walked up uh, sixth floor. And I mean, you could begin a, a lot of the budget was sitting here. Everyone was crowded. Uh, all here, and then there was the rooftop. Um, but you could see sort of the, the, the passion and, and the belief and lots of naysayers and people asking why he's here and not in one of the islands. And, um, and look at what he, they have done with the team. It's amazing. Um, so big, big hand for the crazy people. The 
believers and me were just a testament to what you were told earlier, that change begins with you. No one else is going to make it happen for you. So I just want to start off with that. Um, so a couple of things before I go into why we commissioned the report. I think one is um, we want to share some of the learnings uh, that we're finding in, um, in terms of independent media, both from our investment and from work that we're looking to do going further. And for me personally, uh, those of you who've heard me speak before, um, the power of the narrative is so important. Um, our ability to, to shape, impact, tell our stories, um, drive agendas, discussions. We were just talking earlier this morning about um, Brexit and, and the way you take the whole world, if you turn on the TV, ju just the level of detail and analysis and, and that media is pouring into that story is quite amazing. But the power of the narrative, especially in Africa, is so important and the power to tell our story, to shape agendas, is 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 critical. So for me, it's also personal. I think um, second, it's it's to share learnings, and this is really intended to stimulate conversation. Um, so I won't even go into lots of detail about the report so that you can actually read it. But we're hoping that this is a conversation starter. And during the various panels, I hope there'll be other insights that emerge and and drive the conversation um, further. I think. The other sort of driver for this, when I decided to do some research on my own, and there's a lot of media disruption in Africa, what's going on, what are the trends, there's zero, almost, writing on the opportunity, the size of the market. Um, I think only Eric Kaku has done a report uh, on this, he's a consultant. Um, I see Paul is here, maybe when they were deciding to invest, uh, there were some stats that they used, but there's very, very little um, case studies, research, data, um, and all the examples that are being shown from media disruption, it's New York Times, uh, Atlantic, Pointer. Uh, and so really part of it is to start to build a regional knowledge base of what's happening in our continent as far as media and disruption. Um, I think second, in terms of if you're interested in the methodology for the research, it's all in the report, uh, <laughs> so I encourage you to read it. But also we worked, uh, Reboot has a great team both in Nigeria and Ghana, uh, a series of in -depth interviews with about 58 respondents, uh, including media, government, and civil society in those three focus countries. Um, so just a disclaimer, the lens that we wore uh, was around civic engagement and governance, so some of the lessons are more applicable to that. Uh, and this is the Social Change Summit, after all. Uh, but I do think the lessons in the report apply much more broadly than beyond um, sort of the power of independent media to affect uh, social change. So I hope you find um, whether you're looking at media from entertainment, from lifestyle, for sports, um, I think some of the lessons still remain uh, very, very applicable. I think the final sort of thing uh, for Nigeria specifically, um, we are quite dominant in terms of shaping narratives, music, uh, go to any Kenyan club, I think there's a whole set, at least an hour of just Nigerian music and the same in weddings and so on. Uh, so entertainment, um, TV, Nollywood, go to any government office in Nairobi. Uh, it, it's an Africa magic, the same like in Lagos and Abuja. <laughs> um, and literature, obviously, you, are, you have your Chimamanda, you know, a, any uh, prize for literature in Africa, you sort of have to struggle uh, among the top three Nigerians for uh, other African countries to emerge. And for me, the question is, why aren't you dominating in media? And, and independent media in particular. You have the talent, you have the resources. Uh, you know, there was a, a high moment when with Next, and in fact, we were joking yesterday that the Next alumni, like the McKinsey alumni, <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. I think 
any media organization, you run into Red, uh, the Code, Cabal, uh, everywhere, and Premium Time, Chatter, Nancy, you know, with uh, what he's doing now at SPM. And, and if you look at just that alumni alone, what a deep bench Zelo built. And so why, you know, why, why did you stop there? Because clearly you understand the power of storytelling. And, and so for me it's an open question when I look at the opportunities, like why, why was that the high watermark and why, you know, what would it take to get back there again? Um, so with that, since I, you see, I hate PowerPoints, I'm, judge, I'm, I'm still judging it. Uh, but let's, let's get into the presentation. So the first thing that the report looks at is sort of what's the underlying environment um, for independent media in, or media in general in Nigeria. Uh, the first thing is a low trust in media. Uh, and this is because of presumed partisanship, either from the owners or from the coverage. And it was interesting, uh, some of the conversations we had yesterday, that even if you are independent, there's a lot of pressure to be seen as, are you in a, especially right now, are you PDP or APC? Like there's no, uh, we're speaking premium times and everyone assumes there's sort of a big ogre somewhere in the background because otherwise why aren't they taking any bribes? Um, so there's a, whether it's perception or real, there's very low trust in media. Um, the second thing, I think we know this, but worth emphasizing, the heavy, heavy influence on advertising uh, spend on editorial. Uh, until, until today, uh, again, another sort of anecdote from Premium Times, they ran a story um, and an advertiser canceled the spend immediately, 24 hours later. Quite a prominent person. We should be progressive. And, and so this pressure is, is very real. And you combine that with low journal journalist salaries and so on, and so there's a challenge. So how do you straight through to editorial and pay your bills uh, at the same time is, is, is um, when even as we shift to digital. So before we thought the presumption with next, we could shut down your printing press. Premium Times is digital only, but they need advertising to survive. So there's no threat of shutting down your printing press, but there is a threat of how you're gonna pay your bills to run a story about me. Um, and then finally, there's uh, entertainment sales, right? So we have uh, Linda KG and uh, you know, the, the, in fact, most of the dominant, if you look at the, the top Alexa numbers, is entertainment. That's not unusual. I think Donald Trump sells, right? That's why <laughs> he's a big phenomenon in, in, in the U.S. right now. But I think it crowds out to so figuring out a model where there's a balance between the, the humans, we like entertainment, we like gossip, we like reading about the big four of, you know, the next big person. But how do you balance that sort of reporting, I think, is, is the challenge. And particularly in Nigeria, there's very little analysis, sticking with a story, following up on it. What does this mean for you as a Nigerian? It's sort of very touch and go and you move on to the next thing. So those, I think, are some of the observations that, that I've seen in the report. Um, so there are two main sort of audiences um, for this when we were doing it. Um, we're hoping to get a few more funders in the room, but most are out of the country or in Abuja. But uh, one, for as funders, both grant and investors, what does the know of the land look like and how can we, what role can we play in either seeding innovation or bridging the gap that we see? Um, I think one of the statistics in the report is that out of the total X billion of development spent annually, or philanthropic money annually, uh, only 0.4% goes into media. Uh, and yet, you know, if we're funding governance work, so budget could be doing great work, if no one is reading about the great work that budget is doing and what it means for them, 
is our investment really meaningful if their work is not being amplified? If the fourth estate is not around to keep leaders in check, is everything else that we're doing in terms of our investments meaningful? If CC Hub is doing this amazing work but is strangled by corruption and because there's no one to put that in check, are our are we balancing things out? And so for us really looking at should we be paying much more attention to independent media um, uh, is important and should other funders and can we work better together? The second audience um, was for me media practitioners. Are there emerging models locally and international to learn from and what gaps exist in Nigeria and West Africa right now that are not being filled? And why now? Um, I think one of the most interesting things um, uh, about this study is sort of the role of the citizen in driving the shift. So when you talk about media disruption, a lot it's about the technology, it's about Twitter, it's about WhatsApp, it's about Facebook, um, and how is that changing media? But at the heart of that is the individual. So who's using these tools and how are they shifting? Um, Kenya news nowadays, when you watch it, you, part of it is what's trending. You know, they even say it's trending on Twitter today, <laughs> and and that's a lot of what 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 the individual is able to push back a little bit more on on the narrative. So that's one, and I think in Nigeria we saw this in particular with the last election, uh, that the individual beyond the vote was certainly a lot more influential in terms of driving. Uh, a lot of things around the, um, the elections. Um, second, we're seeing um, media influencing government and vice versa in a way that's a bit more two-way. And then third, we're seeing government responding both to citizens um, and to sort of them trying to interject themselves into the social media space in particular. There are a number, Tolu couldn't be here you know, the appointment of people like Tolu, like Egg, Egghead, uh, this very heavy investment in government being present in that space tells you something. Uh, it's not just so that they can manage a Facebook page. It's th th there's something there that government wants to insert itself into. And so um, what I would say around uh, citizens using it, I'll just move over to the next. I think first is that official narratives are being upended. Uh, and so what could have been normally a press release that appears in the newspaper uh, gets unchallenged. And very quickly, you're able to go on, counteract, uh, give your narrative, someone respond. And so the, the concept of official um, is being upended. I think, and what are those implications for media outlets that have normally relied on the official statement when there's an army now of citizens who are fact-checking on their own and counteracting that? I think that the second thing is speed. Um, you know, if you're not online between 9 a.m. and 5, like a whole story could have started and ended before you even put a whole package together. And, and so, you know, as a traditional outlet, do you compete with that? Do you provide something different? Because it's becoming too noisy, so people are then looking for analysis. But the speed is, is, is so quick, and, and what does that mean? And then we're seeing the rise of influential individuals uh, online, not just in entertainment. Uh, you have your emojis, your this sort of all on the a media house in their own, on, uh, over their laptop, <laughs> and uh, what are the implications of, of, of that? Um, I think shifts also happening with media, it's sort of, the, the two-way now is important. Um, Sahara, for better or worse, pioneered this, a lot of their stories are driven by citizens and citizen reporting, and this was initially by necessity at the time, uh, Torres in exile and couldn't have a team here. 
but now extended. Um, you, 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 as a media outlet, you have to engage with your audience and you need to present perspective. Um, I think we've seen steady, a steady sort of sticking to the story, at least with regards to corruption. And so it's, it's now, uh, it's not a flash, it's, it's, it's saying, I think that's me. Um, and of course, with social media integration, um, whether it's, as I saw, some I was following some tweets and uh, people who are trending, they're like, catch me on Snap. Uh, you know, while I'm here, and you're seeing in the US, the those of you who are following the sitting, you know, they shut down C-SPAN, and all of a sudden, Periscope was a media channel. Uh, and so those, are very, it's not just a US phenomenon, very, um, very, very much something we're seeing here, and particularly the power of video and short form video um, is, is a shift. Uh, so go government response, what are some of the trends we're seeing? I think um, online, capi you know, online support is now a form of political capital. Uh, whether it's trolls <laughs> who are paid to sort of camp in your uh, mentions or respond to issues, um, whether it's investing a little bit more in shaping that narrative, I think we're certainly seeing that, which is different. Um, I've talked about scaling presence on social media. And I think m more responsiveness to public conversations. Um, and, you know, a, a case, uh, case in point is the First Lady and the Parasol conversation. Uh, <laughs> you know, what's that? Uh, the, 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 the blurring between official, public, a national issue, First Lady, um, is all uh, sort of coming together and, and they're having to think about how to manage this um, more carefully, I think. And I think the first, there are two main categories. The first one is around activated audiences. Um, let me just go to the other thing. And I'll go through what we mean by activated audiences. But why does it matter? I think given particularly the role of the individual and in all the forms of media we're talking about, and particularly with technology, your ability to ignite dialogue and conversation with that individual user is becoming much more important for your success. I think understanding um, what makes audiences tick and why it's essential is something that stood out um, a lot in the report. And finally, given the challenges of monetization and, and figuring out we're moving from sort of a traditional, even banner ad and placing an ad in the paper. A lot of it depends on understanding your audience very, very well. And so that is not just about spurring action or change, but also how you get to pay your bills. Um, and there are three elements, uh, I think, of uh, activated audiences that stood out. Uh, the first is acquisition. Um, an activation and action, and I'll go through them just at a high level um, so that you can read the report to find out more. So acquisition, I think um, a lot of the focus has been until now, you know, how many followers, what are your page views, what are your links, and even us as funders and investors, we're moving away from, from looking at those sort of as metrics of, of success. And, and those organizations that really stand, that stand out are really looking, going deeper in either a niche or just understanding their beat and how to adjust to it. So in Nigeria, uh, Wazobia stands out. Um, they understand their audience and, and, and they adjust to it and they keep up with them and, and, and sort of the both in terms of entertainment, in terms of impact. It's the only radio station I listen to when um, I'm in Lagos, although I've been told now, Urban FM is something I should turn on to. And one of the shows yesterday morning was the Office of the Citizen, 
uh, and they had a young woman from budget talking about um, callers could call in and ask about projects in their area and what budget has found out about them. And there was a role of whether the national, whether constituency funds really matter, or are they just being wasted? And this was a very sort of engaged, it's a young woman talking on budget issues and callers calling in to ask about their constituency, trying to find out more what budget does uh, in a language that people can relate to. Uh, and so that kind of, if you can't go wide, go deep, you don't have the resources, they stand out. Um, BBC House or Radio um, actually wins is winning a lot of awards just because of how they've been able to tap into that particular community. And I think uh, what seems to be untapped here is more local language um, opportunities Regional, uh, I was speaking with Chet yesterday about so there's a radio station in Anambra that's apparently, if you're there, it's, it's doing really, really well. And so I think if we look at how big Nigeria is and what the opportunities are, local, regional, going deep is, is untapped. I think as funders, what's our role? We can support more research into mapping those opportunities uh, and into understanding what the needs are and the gaps are much Deeper. So if you come and say, look, I have um, X radio station and red media, I want to do more in the north, how do I get in there, what are the gaps, we should be willing to walk that journey and help them explore how to target niche audiences. Um, global organizations that stand out, uh, two of them we've supported, ProPublica uh, is one, and they're just focused on the public interest. And, and going very, very deep in, into that. Um, news Deeply, they do niche areas, so there's, you know, on Syria crisis, if you want to go that, you can go very deep. And I think this is more just in terms of they're spending a lot more um, research on understanding the audience and tweaking everything from placement of stories to headlines. Sabi News locally, I think, and there's a case study about them in the report, and they certainly stand out in terms of audience acquisition. Um, the next is, is, is the activation. So people are coming to your website now. They know you. How do you keep them coming back? How do you keep them sticking? Uh, I think two things stand out there. As practitioners, again, moving beyond basic metrics, um, sort of tracking every day what they're responding to and, and adjusting to that. I think as funders, um, doing more to invest in tools. So you know, you need to go more beyond Google Analytics is not going to cut it for you. Um, in fact, there's um, Sahara Reporters is part of a cohort now from an organization we funded in the past, where they're uh, and it's looking at six different investigative organizations to track the impact of the story. So a lot of times you find that they might break the news and then someone else follows up and does now a proper sort of report, and it's always hard for them to come back and say, well, this is the impact of our story. But the organizations now that are working to go much deeper and help you as a news organization of your premium times, okay, but did your story really have an impact? And they're helping them track that. Um, I think examples that stand out, Rappler is one of our investments in the Philippines, and they have something called a mood monitor. So if you read a story, instead of asking you to like it, that how do you feel? How did the story make you feel? Uh, you know, so going a bit deeper into less, again, likes or stars or whatever and comment, it's, it's, it's really trying to find out more and then building that back into the stories that they run. The Coco I love, um, first because you go in for like five minutes and half an hour later, you're still there, <laughs> wondering what the hell is going on. Um, and, and you know, the little tricks that they do, you know, pops up and it's so easy to share quickly on Facebook. And, um, and what they figured out is first how to churn good consistency. And there's, trust me, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, and I'm in Kenya reading the Koko Y um, because it turns out, you know, the average high school experience for a boarding school for a Nigerian 
pretty similar to a Kenyan boarding uh, high school experience. And so they, they're beginning to get a sense of this. Some of it is Nigerian, a lot of it is African, a lot of it is diaspora. But I think for me that I can lose myself in that site, even though I, I just saw something quickly on Twitter that is, is interesting. And they're really doing a lot on, on, on audience engagement. And Vox uh, also stands out in terms of once you're on, how do we keep you here and engage with our stories? Um, and then, you know, social change, action. Uh, again, the lens we use is sort of saying if you have the independent media, you've built it. Ideally, you want your stories to drive something more, um, whether it's better scrutiny, whether it's outrage, whether it's a response from government, whether it's a clarification. So how do you do that? I think we're in the governance lens, um, pegging the, the, the content to political promises. I think the Buhari meter, um, collaboration between premium times and, and budget stands out where after 100 days you're sort of saying what, what did you promise and we're following up. Um, I think as funders we need a long form deep investigative, con it takes time. So we funded the, um, the Ghana, those who, I don't know anyone who followed Anas who did the big expose in Ghana uh, that got 30 judges fired, took two years. Um, to, to, to get that story and lots of threats and, uh, you know, worried about the, because he was, un he actually paid bribes. <laughs> so there's that, to get the story and so the implications of all of that. Um, you know, someone has to be willing sometimes to back that in terms of, of impact. So that's the challenge for us as, as funders. Um, okay, are we... I think the elections um, were very interesting also. I think the, the, the collaboration between citizens, media, the results, the real time, situation room. I mean, we were all glued. I, I followed the entire Nigerian election on Twitter. I think everyone did. And, and, and it sort of upended the role of INEC, uh, government, Whoever, and those were secondary to, to sort of this collaboration and marshalling of efforts of civil society and media and leveraging technology. So I think those are the moments for me that, that that's in the report that stand out. Um, I just flipped through this quickly. We think the opportunities, one, at the individual level to the extent that your omojuas and other individuals are standing up as powerhouses, can we equip them? better to do, you know, to do more better. You can't ignore them. They're influential. Should we resource them better? Uh, is there a platform we can create for freelance journalists? So maybe you want to do a long story on an issue, but not all the time. Can there be a platform for that? And training on business, how to monetize, uh, and so on. And Bloomberg is actually doing a lot on um, financial reporting for individual journalists. So can we extend that? Um, I think at the organizational level, co-funding, uh, something that stands out, uh, Omedia does co-funding, one of the few, so we very rarely do we do programmatic funding. We try and help you actually pay the bills. Um, and you find, again, I'll use Premium Times as an example, they're getting a lot of grant funding, but it's for very niche particular reports. Uh, they still have to pay rent. And, and so on and so forth, or they're going to write a story that might cost them advertising. So can we support them at a more base sort of core level? Can we be more responsive to the stage of where the organization is? So perhaps seed ideas and allow for experimentation. Um, I think those are the gaps that we're seeing as, as funders. Um, and at the field level, this is already a conversation we're starting, we've started in South Africa where it can several of us pool funds across, whether it's grants, investments, and so on, so that we're de-risking each other. Um, and the same here, I mean, there's a lot of money locally. When we're doing growth capital, my challenge to Basun said, I'll give half if you find half locally. 
and he did. Uh, and, and so I think the same, it's not just international funders. To the extent that they're investors locally, can we get them to look at media as an opportunity in a more structured way? And then finally, can we build sort of back-end tools? Uh, that way, if digital is not your strong suit, you just want to write the story, are there CMS platforms that I sort of worry when I see every new sort of startup coming up with their own digital tool and their own sort of, and, and perhaps we're better off funding a shared resource that they can just tap into and go ahead and do the storytelling, which is what they do best. Um, so, conclusion, citizens at the center of the media shift. Funders' role is critical across all the levels I mentioned. And I think we hope the report has useful lessons for practitioners as well, and this should be an ongoing conversation. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more, um, please, the link is on our website. It's on Reboot's website. And a uh, big thank you to the Reboot team who did an amazing job of pulling this all together. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen and Ori, for all that you do and for that presentation.